Hi, way back in episode number 744, linked in up the top, down below, at the end if you haven't seen it, and I highly recommend you do, because it's all about surface mount thermal design, how to get uh, power out of SMD thermal components out through your case of your product. And Yes, I've actually, this might be familiar, I've redrawn this entire thing. So why am I going over previous material like this? Aha, it's because there's a new part or new parts on the market. Actually, well, they don't revolutionize this, but they provide another really nice option for getting heat out of SMD thermal parts. So I thought we'd take a look at them, but we really have to go back to this original uh, diagram to explain what we're talking about here. Now, obviously, I'm not going to go over everything again, but we will recap it. Everything's in that video. Highly recommend you watch it. I go into much more detail. Now, of course, it's very easy to get heat out of through hole parts like a TO220 package. They've got a big bolt hole in them. You bolt them into your, the side of your case, Bob's your uncle, gets the heat out, no worries. How do you do it for an SMD part though? Well, once you've decided that your design is going to be surface mount, you want as much of your design to be as surface mount as possible because then it can all go into the pick and place machine and then it all just magically comes out. You don't want extra bolts and washers and, and heat bars and heat sinks that you have to bolt in and screw on and things like that. They're all extra production operation steps, extra cost, everything else. And yes, you can actually get a surface mount heat sinks suitable for pick and place machines they're usually quite small because the pick and place machines with their little suction heads don't have you know a huge amount of suction force that's on your board and then reflow it of course because they're a heat sink they suck all the heat out of your joint when you try and reflow them but you know you can get here's an example of some small SMD heat sinks that you can actually get uh, to put on your design and they're okay but your traditional solution for this is uh, in orange here is solder it onto a large copper pad like this and then there you have uh, firm thermal vias like this going through the green PCB here and then in this case through to a thermal transfer block or a thermal transfer bar which then transfers it to uh, the case and you can get rid of the heat from the case. Beauty. And this is where you start talking about your electrical thermal equivalent circuits. And basically the idea is that uh, current is equal to power from your power source, which is your device, and then it flows through all of the thermal resistances. Instead of electrical resistances, they're thermal resistors, and they've got R theta there, so JC, you'll see this in da data sheets, that's junction to case, so inside the little transistor, that from the junction in there, how much thermal resistance to get it to the case, and then you've got thermal resistance of the via here, thermal resistance of your insulating seal pad, thermal resistance of your heat uh, transfer block, your thermal resistance of your case and then you've got the ambient temperature and uh, voltage in this equivalent circuit is equivalent to temperature and then you've got essentially what you might call a thermal ground I guess um, and then you've got your ambient temperature so every part through the step the voltage will increase if you've got current thrown through here the voltage at each point will increase and therefore in the thermal equivalent circuit, uh, your temperature will increase. So your junction up here, the junction temperature up there, it can't exceed the maximum data sheet recommended junction temperature. So the art of thermal design is trying to keep your, in worst case conditions, worst case ambient, because if ambient rises, everything else rises as well, is trying to stay under within your data sheet temperature limits and temperature of other parts inside which might be affected like electrolytic capacitors for example if you have them close they might you know the electrolyte inside heats up you shorten their life etc etc now here's where we get into the detail of we're going to talk about these thermal jumpers here these new components out that 
might change the game for a lot of designs. So let's take a look at them, right? Your traditional uh, way of getting your heat out of your part is to have a large amount of copper like this, okay, which you dedicate to that particular component or the tab of that uh, component and then you get the heat out and you want that not only because it's a large surface area but then you have all these vias in here which via stitch and this is roughly there's a uh, limit of thermal resistance of a via is about roughly 50 degrees C per watt for a one millimeter hole for example and depending on the number of holes you got then the lower the overall thermal resistance of your via here so if you've only got one via, trying to get all the power through one via, it's very high high thermal resistance. So it turns out the optimum value is about 10, because beyond that, it starts to, like this, uh, you get the effects of the heat spreading across the pad and all sorts of, you know, intricate thermal stuff. You really need like really expensive thermal modeling software to actually do that properly. But you know, 10 vias or something like that might be optimal. Anyway, let's actually forget all about uh, getting the heat out uh, to your your external metal case through your thermal transfer block and your sill pad and everything else because that was the previous video go watch it what we're going to focus on today is using these new thermal jumper parts to actually utilize the internal ground plane in your PCB in, as a heatsink instead of actually uh, like you know using a little SMD heatsink on top or using uh, thermal or just using one large pad you don't have to use uh, thermal vias they're only if you want to transfer the heat down to the bottom layer for some reason because you might have more routing room down there like you might this might be the top layer but then you might happen to have like this much space on the bottom layer for example you know because you didn't need the routing room you might have that room for a large uh, an extra heatsink plane on the bottom side as well as a small one on the top. So you might use thermo vias to get down to the bottom layer and then spread the heat across there. And how that heat gets out to the external case, we're not going to worry about in this video. So we're going to assume that the device you're trying to get the heat out of cannot be electrically connected to ground or power plane because you've got your four layer PCB, right? These days, four layer PCBs are cheap as chips and if you're doing any sort of advanced design, you're probably gonna be doing a four layer board anyway. So you've got this huge ground and power and likely power plane inside your product. Why can't you use that as a heatsink, and it's like those uh, SMD heatsinks that we showed before. Yeah, you could use one of those, but they're actually fairly expensive in their own right, and they take up physically height, you know, extra room inside your case. But if you've got a really compact design, really low form factor, it might be advantageous, greatly advantageous. It might be game changing for you to use your internal ground plane, which is all the way through, like this, all the way through your product. Why not use that? as a heatsink. And of course, uh, you might want to change your layer stack on your PCB if you do this. Like usually uh, when you do a four layer board, the ground and power planes are going to be in the middle of your PCB and the signals are top and traces are top and bottom layers. But if thermal is a major consideration in your design, then you may actually want to flip that. You may want to have power and ground on the outside or at least ground on the outside layer so that uh, either top or bottom so that then then you can use it as a heatsink, as we'll see, using these thermal jumpers because they're absolutely fantastic and game changing. And then, uh, of course, because the copper's on the outside of the PCB, it's actually uh, more readily available to transfer. It doesn't have the insulative properties of the fiberglass wedged in the middle of the PCB. So having your co copper on your top or bottom layer, your big ground plane, is much more effective. But then you've got to take signal integrity and look out and all that sort of stuff. But let's assume that thermal is one of your major priorities and you want and you want to or need to just use your ground plane well if you've got your traditional method like this you can't because this uh, device that you're using can't be electrically connected to ground or power plane because it'll short out because the uh, tab on the device is electrically it's the V out pin or it's the uh, you know V in pin or some other electrical pin that's not ground. So you can't just V a stitch to ground. If you're lucky enough to have a device where your thermal tab is either isolated or is grounded, then great. Just thermal V a stitch 
down to your uh, ground plane, either internal or external. But where the thermal jumpers come in is in most parts like this need to be electrically isolated. That's why sill pads exist. That's why you use uh, insulation on majority of thermal devices because they can't be electrically connected to ground. So in this case, you have two choices. You can devote a whole lot of your PCB routing area to just the heatsink, the isolated, electrically isolated heatsink for that particular device. But then you've you've ruined, like you're wasting all of that space. If you've got a really dense design, then you can't put any traces on there at all. Um, it's a real problem. But if you use your ground plane, aha, that changes your entire routing uh, dynamics and your routing density and everything else. So how do you do it? with these thermal jumpers. Okay, so let's assume that you've got your SMD part that you want to get the heat out of. It needs to be electrically isolated, but you want to use your big ground plane as a heat sink, and why wouldn't you? Now, of course, you're going to have your uh, copper pad to solder your uh, part down onto, of course, your SMD part, but then how do we get the heat out to the ground plane? Well, we can get our thermal jumper like this. It looks something like this. Let's just, I'll just draw it like this. They come in different shapes and sizes. And by the way, when it comes to thermal jumpers, is width better or length better? No, I'm telling you, width is better. You want a short, fat, stubby one than a big, long one. Trust me, you're gonna get much better thermal transfer from a big fatty. So these thermal jumpers, here's a photo of them, they just look like, you know, regular SMD resistors available in long, thin, narrow ones, big, fat, wide ones, or, uh, you know, they just look like regular resistors, but they're electrically isolated, there's no resistance in them, and but they're thermally conductive. So you just use uh, just your regular pads like this for, any, for that regular package uh, size like that, and then you simply put a big, fat trace in there like that, that connects through to this thermal jumper. And then of course this one here, you would just then put your thermal vias like that to stitch it down to your ground. So now you've got your heat, it flows from your device, it flows through your copper like this, it's pretty efficient at this point. Then it flows through your thermal jumper like this. They, they don't have a zero thermal resistance, but you know, they're reasonably low. We'll take a look at the data sheet in a minute. And then uh, it flows into your vias like this, and then it flows down your vias into your big power plane, big ground plane, all over like this. So you can use your entire board as a heat sink, but taking up very little space. So, you know, I've drawn it quite large here, but these things can actually take up a small amount of space. And if you want to, you can actually use multiple ones. You can have one here, one here, one on this side. You can put them all around your device if you, you know, do your thermal calculations, your back of your envelope calculations at the design stage, and just go, yeah, I think I'll probably need three of them or something like that. Now, these things aren't particularly cheap. They start from like, you know, a thousand of quantity, start from about 30 cents a pop. But hey, the, the little SMD heat sinks uh, that we looked at before, they're not cheap either. Um, and they take up vertical height, but this way, everything's low profile. So, and enables your design to uh, be a really small size, but it could be much more efficient because you're using your entire ground plane, which could be on the outside of your layer of your board, as I said, and then you take the solder mask off, of course, if you're using the ground plane as a uh, heat sink, then you wouldn't cover it with solder mask generally. Um, that's just less efficient. So that's the beauty of these thermal jumpers, and it really is game changing. As far as I'm aware, they've only been out for like the last year or two, um, and they might be expensive, but it could radically change your thermal design for your product. It could really enable it. Whereas before, you know, you had to have this big isolated pad. Now, in every design, you can use your ground plane as a heat sink. Beautiful. All right, we'll just take a quick look at the data sheet here because, well, there's nothing to it. And these are fairly new parts. You can see down here, uh, first revision January 2019. So uh, they're available from two manufacturers that I'm aware of. One is Vache and the other is uh, this company I've never heard of, the Engineer's Choice. There they are, uh, American Technical Ceramics. As they call them thermal conductors, Vache call them thermal jumpers.
basically, um, it, look, it looks very much like a resistor, except it's non-conductive. They've just got an aluminium nitride uh, substrate inside, and that's what is makes it thermally conductive. And then just got the regular end caps with the nickel and solder uh, termination. You get different finishes and things like that. You can get lead or lead uh, available. Yes, lead or lead free. And they're saying it's greater than a gig, but they're basically, yeah, they're as good as open. Um, it's suitable for power supplies, RF amplifiers, synthesizers, switch mode power supplies. That'd be a biggie. And here's a very nice look at, uh, they've got a thermal camera. I, I could maybe do some tests, but um, <laughs> buy these and set up custom PCB in different configurations. That'd be nice. Let me know in the comments down below if you want me to go to that sort of effort. But I don't expect any results uh, different to this. But it'd be nice. Maybe I can check thermal vias and things like that. Show the difference between pads and ground planes. And I, you know, so they've just got a resistor here. I don't know. What is that like? Looks like 1206, something like that. And they just put in a current through it, heating up the resistor. And with nothing, right? So with just the extra size pad here. So they have not installed the thermal jumper like they had here. Okay, this is a 1206 size thermal jumper. So this is without the thermal jumper, the resistor gets up to 150 degrees Celsius. But if you whack in the thermal jumper like this, and it's got like a large uh, trace in there just connecting the two pads. So this is one pad for the thermal jumper. This is the other pad here. Well, it's got this large um, a pad over here. There's no th looks like there's no via stitching or anything like that. They're just using the thermal jumper going to just a larger pad here, acting as a heat sink. Um, and look, it's dropped down to 95 degrees. Wow, that makes a that makes a huge difference. And that's not connecting it through to the ground. I presumably not connecting it through to the ground plane. So I reckon if you put little thermal vias in there going down to a ground plane you'll get a substantial improvement over that 95 degrees what you get i don't know you can do some back of the envelope uh, calculations um and but then of course it's going through to a much larger heat sink which is your ground plane and how much thermal resistance we're we talking about well we've got the data here look at this so thermal resistance in degrees c per what none of that milli watts per uh, degree c uh, thermal conductance rubbish it's one over no bugger that um we're, we're talking for like an 0603 okay 14 degrees c per watt so it's not that great but as i said if you go for the short fat one like this is oc what 0603 means is that it's uh half as wide as it is long so but this one the 0612 is twice as wide as it is long and it drops from 14 degrees um c per watt to four degrees c per watt so four degrees c per watt is uh, you know on par with like 10 thermal vias or you know something like that so it's it's pretty decent performance and once again you get a nice big fat one over here the 1225 that'd be that jobby there look at that oh look at that just short and fat because you want it fat and wide so that all the thermals can get through and dielectric uh, with standing voltage, 1.5 kilovolts, and capacitance is a big thing as well. Because if you've got, if you're using these on switching power transistors, especially in RF applications and things like that, that can be a big deal. So you want them to have ultra low capacitance. Is 0.07 puff. That's like half a bee's dick. And that does, of course, increase for your uh, wider ones, your short fatties like that. So it's a trap, but it's still like, it's, you know, 0.2 puff. It's nothing. And these other parts from uh, Cubridge, I won't go through them. You can look, I'll link the data sheets in down below. They're exactly the same. Uh, the thermal resistance, slightly better. These can get down to, look, three uh, degrees C per watt, but these ones are available. They're available in aluminium nitride or beryllium oxide as well. And the beryllium oxide, just a smidge lower thermal resistance. So, you know, if you've got some, you know, whiz-bang military application and you don't care about cost and, you know, just, yeah, yeah it's better, more better. It's actually uh, substantially different for some of these others. Look at this, 13 compared to 20 for an 0603. So there's advantages there. And the Fache ones, they're available on DigiKey here. I'm not sure of the other website. Not sure where the others are available from. But look, uh, these are thousand of uh, quantities. We're talking like, you know, like 38 uh, cents here and stuff like that. But they can actually go up like 50 a dollar. Now you're talking, oh, $1.26 for the big fatties down here. Whoa, it's worth every cent. So I think these things are really quite game changing and they seem to be fairly new parts. Please leave it down below if these are being available for donkey's years. But this is the first I've heard of them. So thank you very much for the viewer who uh, pointed these out to me. These are great. Um, yeah, uh, could radically 
enable uh, designs, uh, small form factor designs that you just couldn't do before. So yeah, could be game changing. Check them out. So there you go, I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please give it a big a thumbs up. And as always, leave comments down below or over on the EV blog forum link down below. Every video has its own forum thread. That's where people can discuss stuff if you don't want to discuss it on the YouTubes and all of my alternative platforms. YouTube went down today, um, famously. But the good thing is all my videos are available on like half a dozen alternative platforms. So check it out. Catch you next time. Hello.